Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to have you here. Uh, my name is Lindsay Eilers and I'm the Director for Impact Assessment and Evaluation at Enterprise Community Partners. And I'm going to cover just a couple housekeeping items before we jump into the content. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. After the webinar, we'll send an email to all registered attendees, including the PowerPoint deck, the webinar recording, and a link to the study's final report. So if you have any follow-up questions for any of today's speakers after the session, you can reply to that email that you'll receive and we'll make sure to connect you with the right person. And then lastly on housekeeping, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So please type your questions into the question box within the webinar format, uh, really at any time in the conversation, and we'll get to those questions at the end. So we're really excited that you can join us today. Uh, this conversation and the research behind it is truly years in the making. And so we're really excited to share the research findings that came out. Um, you can see a picture of the final report here. It was released in April of this year. Uh, we'll be talking about the policy and practice recommendations that came out of this research and the realities of what it takes to do this work well and improve indoor air quality and affordable housing. Uh, Jonathan Wilson from the National Center for Healthy Housing will be providing an overview of the study, sharing about the findings and recommendations, and then we'll transition to a panel discussion that will help us consider what's next for our industry as we translate this research into action that brings ventilation and its benefits for indoor air quality into affordable housing, really with the goal of improving uh, resident health. Our panel will be moderated by Oganaya Dotson Newman from the JPB Foundation, and our panelists include Miranda Brazil, a healthy housing researcher, Krista Egger from Enterprise Community Partners, and James Lewis from Pinnacle Construction Group. Um, they'll each introduce themselves a little bit more when we move into the panel discussion. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Jonathan from the National Center for Healthy Housing so that we can dive in. Thank you, Lindsay. As Lindsay said, this, this research project truly was a labor of love. Um, we've been working on this for a number of years. We actually had a little change in the, the middle of it, but what we're gonna be talking about now is the project that uh, started in 2018, and it was really developed looking at the effect of greenhousing. As we were looking into our, our interests, we found that in talking to developers, a major portion of, of differential between conventional housing and greenhousing um, as certified like under the enterprise green communities criteria was the ventilation requirements under these programs, uh, specifically meeting the ASHRAE 622 ventilation standards. And so the study was focused on that, looking at continuous mechanical ventilation, that's what we'll be calling it instead of calling it ASHRAE. And we were interested in the effect in multifamily homes in New York and in Chicago. The study was funded by the JPB Foundation, Wells Fargo, and the Kresge Foundation. And our research partners included the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City and the University of Illinois, Chicago. The focus of the study was on multifamily affordable housing. These are units that are often eligible for long-term housing tax credits and are commonly in green programs that require certain things to go on in these properties when the, during renovations to achieve a health and safety level that is important for our lower income families across the country. These properties have all been renovated in the last eight years. They're all meeting the green criteria, but half of them required the ASHRAE ventilation while the other half did not. Uh, they probably were, were moderate renovations since they did not require the full continuous ventilation. With our study, we found that there were enrolled 160 housing units across 12 developments in the two cities. And our data collection was to visit these homes three times over an eight month period to first enroll the family. And also at the first visit, we would do a visual assessment of the property. We would sometimes at the same time, sometimes in a, within a, a short period of time, we would do ventilation testing to get a good baseline of what the ventilation levels were in the home. Commonly, the ventilation was being done with exhaust ventilation out of the bathroom fan. In some places, they actually also had a bathroom fan and a kitchen fan in the property. And for the homes that were in the comparison group, they didn't have continuous mechanical ventilation, but they often had a bathroom fan itself that they 
property residents could control. So that was the difference between the ventilation systems. One was on continuous, running all the time. The other was often controlled by the resident. So it was unclear how often they used it and for what time and what reason. In addition to the visual assessment and the ventilation testing, we did questionnaires of the residents, both of their, their health status, as well as their use patterns of the, the property. So how often did they open their windows? How often did they cook meals? These were all important to understand potential levels of contaminants in the units and other potential mitigation, such as opening windows versus the ventilation. And then for our outcome measures, we did environmental sampling over a four-day period in the main living area at each of these three visits to understand the levels of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, formaldehyde, nitrogen dioxide, and particulate matter at a, a range of 2.5 microns. So those are the five contaminants we looked at in the study. And what we found was that the dwellings in the study group, those that had the continuous mechanical ventilation had significantly lower particulate matter and carbon dioxide. Those dwellings with continuous mechanical ventilation in the kitchen had significantly lower carbon monoxide and formaldehyde levels, while the nitrogen dioxide levels were basically the same in the study and control groups. And this was an important factor because nitrogen dioxide is a byproduct of gas stoves. And I should have mentioned up front that when we were designing this, we wanted to, you know, to, to see, fully see the effects of ventilation. We required the units that were enrolled to have gas stoves because we know that between the cooking byproducts as well as the cooking process and creating particulates, we would likely see higher levels of contaminants indoor in these units. And so we were interested in seeing an effect of the ventilation in, in units that were likely to have higher levels of contaminants. So digging a little deeper into these study findings, as I mentioned, we found that in the study group, we had lower levels of particulate matter and carbon dioxide. Those dwellings in the study group had 21% lower levels of fine particulate matter. And these levels are associated with higher respiratory disease, respiratory exacerbation, as well as cardiovascular disease. Some might call this asthma attacks. We found that this was true in homes with tobacco smoke. Uh, we asked that the residents did not smoke during the, the sampling period, but we did find through testing of nicotine that there were some homes where it appeared that there was some smoking going on in these properties. And these were not all smoke-free properties. So even if they didn't smoke during the sampling period, they may have been smoking right before it. So we found that the PM levels were lower in both those units with smoking and without it, but they were continue to be higher in those units with any tobacco smoke recorded over the last year. And the other finding was that we found 13% lower levels of carbon dioxide in the study group and the comparison group. And we know that higher levels of carbon dioxide are associated with reduced cognition um, performance and is also a marker of indoor air quality. We've heard a lot about this during COVID in that units with higher carbon dioxide likely have higher levels of viruses in the air. Major observation two was that we found that with kitchen ventilation, we saw lower levels of carbon monoxide and formaldehyde. These are potential off-gassing things from the gas stove, as well as formaldehyde may have been coming from kitchen cabinetry that was not replaced during the renovations. And we found that with kitchen ventilation, we saw 47% lower carbon monoxide in the dwellings with the kitchen vents than without it. And I should note that we didn't have any carbon monoxide levels that were at a, a threat risk to the residents. These were very low levels, but still we saw a significant difference in those homes with the kitchen ventilation without. We also found that with continuous kitchen exhaust, we had 29% lower levels of formaldehyde and this is a cancer risk as well as other respiratory factors can be associated with formaldehyde. And the final major finding that we had was that for nitrogen dioxide levels, we did not see an effect between the two groups. We had hypothesized we did. That was the basis for the power calculation for the study. And we were surprised and disappointed that we did not find that. We did not find that the units with continuous kitchen exhaust had lower NO2 as well. And so, 
in our study findings, we came up with recommendations, um, and I'll go through those. We believe that people should be incorporating ASHRAE 62.2 into their codes and into their certification process for build, green building, and that it should be for both moderate and substantial renovations. We believe that in order to do this, we need to have our housing finance agencies increase the funding to allow for the cost of this ventilation to be installed. And we need to work with ASHRAE committee to simplify it. We heard many concerns about the challenges of implementing this. So it's not only the money, but the challenges of implementation. So there needs to be a clearer direction for engineers and the developers so they can better understand and achieve better compliance. And we need to also understand indoor air quality. It would be easier to advance these policies if we had better knowledge of what indoor air contaminants are in the, in the property. We believe that based on our findings with NO2, that we need to replace gas stoves with electric induction stoves. The ventilation was not the solution. And if we can't find an engineering problem to pollution, we should go back to the source. And the source here was the gas stoves. So we encourage people to be replacing their gas stoves with an electric. Cases we need to look to reduce or eliminate indoor contaminant sources. I mentioned smoking. Smoke-free policies are good and, and are really needed. So while we saw lower levels in smoking units of particulate matter with ventilation, they were still much more elevated than they were without uh, indications of smoking. And we also need to work with our building managers and operators to improve the ventilation of, of the maintenance of ventilation systems. We know that we saw that in some of these units, the design specs were not being met a couple of years after installation, and it appears that they, they needed to be better maintained to achieve that. We also need to work with our resident services coordinators in properties to educate our occupants about ventilation and how to operate properly. So it goes hand in hand with the maintenance. So part of this is with the property owner, part of it was with the resident. And ASHRAE and others need to work on better technical assistance to help people understand the value of, of ventilation and also how to design and install it. You know, ultimately, this is about better indoor air quality. And for that, we need better public education that this is a concern and that um, it is a value to have a better, safer indoor air quality in our homes and that we should be doing what we can to improve that. So with that, I wanna thank you and turn it back to Lindsay for our panel discussion. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for that great overview of the study, its findings and the recommendations. There's a lot to dive into here, so we're excited for the panel discussion. Um, just a reminder for everyone that you can submit questions at any time uh, through the question section on the webinar panel on your screen. And as I mentioned earlier, the panel will be moderated by Oganaya Dotson Newman from the JPB Foundation. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Oganaya to kick us off. And can you uh, introduce yourself and just share a little bit about the JPB Foundation's role in the study and your perspective on the findings uh, before we kind of dive into the rest of the panel? Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> my name is Oganaya Dotson Newman. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a senior program officer here at the JPB Foundation. My portfolio focuses on environmental health. For those of you that don't know the JPB Foundation that well, we've been around for about 10 years. Our mission is to advance opportunity in the United States through transformational initiatives that empower those living in poverty, enrich and sustain our environment and enable pioneering medical research. I sit in our environment program. We have kind of four big buckets of work. That is energy, green infrastructure, environmental justice, and my portfolio, environmental health. Um, the focus of the environmental health portfolio is really to look at mitigating and addressing any type of contaminants in the indoor and outdoor environment. Part of the portfolio really focuses on creating a more innovative, diverse environmental health movement, supporting organizations that are doing work around outdoor air quality, and how we came to this work in supporting this study and being the primary funder of this study is really focusing on cleaner, greener, healthier materials that go into affordable housing. The entire environment program has a strong focus on affordable housing and on the home as part of the environment. We deeply believe and a lot of our work is focused and really guided by the principle that housing is a human right and that there should be healthy, clean, affordable housing for all people. 
So this made us excited because there isn't a ton of research out there that really talks about and really quantifies the impact that some of these green improvements or that healthy affordable materials or that anything really in the in indoor environment, how it can mitigate and impact and sometimes improve health. And so we set, sought to do that in partnership with Enterprise um, and in partnership with the National Center for Healthy Housing and many of the other partners. Um, we were really excited. It was definitely a journey that we went on in learning. And we think it's a great model for other foundations or philanthropic entities to really look into all of the things that can go into funding a study like this over the long term, and then thinking about ways to really incorporate and implement a lot of the recommendations that we're talking about and how those deeply interact with the place where we've all learned that we're spending a lot of our time and we're all learning about the real impact that housing can have on health. So that's just a little bit about JPB, about my portfolio, and about myself. Um, and I'd like to give some of my fellow panelists a chance to introduce themselves. So maybe you all could give a brief introduction to yourselves. Um, so Miranda, why don't you go ahead? Yes, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited and honored to be here with all of you today to really discuss the important findings that we found in the studying the optimal ventilation for environmental indoor air quality or the stove study as we affectionately call it. As Oganaya and Lindsay stated, I'm Miranda Brazil and I have spent the last 10 years researching and working in healthy homes programs. Previously, I managed a childhood lead poisoning prevention program and I have worked on research projects which investigated um, lead exposure pathways, looked at pesticide exposure in residential dust, and indoor air quality metrics, including the stove study we're talking about today. Specifically for the stove study, I worked as the Chicago site coordinator. And through this position, I interacted with study participants directly throughout the study process, and I conducted some of the data collection that Jonathan briefly touched on. I'm currently working as a consultant in public health and healthy homes programs. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Krista. Great, thank you both. Happy to be here as well. I'm Krista Egger. I'm a vice president of Enterprises Building Resilient Futures team. It's a group focused at the intersection of climate and affordable housing. And we try to take a really holistic approach to what high quality affordable housing development is, which includes looking at healthy housing practices. Enterprise Green Communities is the flagship program of my team. And Enterprise Green Communities is a national green building program for affordable housing, active for almost 20 years, and includes requirements and recommendations for mechanical ventilation. So I and my team weren't directly involved in the study, but we are now examining how to shift our practice and policies in response to the results. Um, so happy to be here with you all today, and I'll pass it to James. Yeah, hi, my name is James Lewis. I am the uh, Director of Real Estate Development for our Pinnacle Construction Group. A licensed architect and a certified passive house consultant. Uh, formerly was an enterprise Rose Fellow, architectural Rose Fellow with Hartland Housing out of Chicago for four years before joining Pinnacle Construction. You know, at Hartland, we developed a good you know, 250 units in the four years I was there utilizing uh, enterprise green communities, lead, passive house certifications through all those programs and Currently, I work with other affordable housing developers in the Michigan area, um, primarily Samaritas, doing more uh, you know, work with the low-income housing tax credit. Um, and so I'm very immersed with the challenges of, of ventilation when designing and building uh, you know, these kind of projects, especially as they relate to existing buildings and historic, historic resources. So thanks so much for introducing yourselves. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm going to start out with a question that really, I think, is going to allow us to nerd out, I guess, a little bit. And nerd out in the best way, right? Because we're all very passionate, I think, about healthy, affordable housing and about taking the information from the study and being able to translate it into practice and what we do. So can you all just talk about, I guess Miranda can start us off again, um, what do you consider the most exciting thing about this study, given too that you had such an integral role in kind of like the day-to-day -day operations of it. So you probably got to see all the exciting things. <laughs> I don't know if exciting is always the right word, but yes, it was a <laughs> very wonderful journey. Um, and again, 
speaking for the team. We're so excited to finally be here to share this with you. But I, I think going back to the question, one of the things that is most meaningful or the biggest takeaway that I, I've seen come out of the study is one of the key things we've consistently heard from building developers, funders, even policymakers, is this the, there's this conception that there isn't enough research to always justify the added cost for mechanical ventilation. There's these hurdles and it's kind of well established that, you know, sometimes they, they might be too burdensome to overcome. But this study specifically speaks to this, this gap in literature that everyone kind of references. This study does indicate that mechanical ventilation and in particular continuous ventilation significantly impacts indoor air pollutants that occupants are exposed to. Additionally, it, it really does speak to the importance of recognizing smoke-free building policies and just all the, the impact that these types of policies that the enterprise green community criteria does speak to. So those are my, my two key takeaways from this study that I'm, I'm very excited for. Thanks. And Krista, did you want to also let us know? Yeah, sure thing. And um, maybe to just say up front too, to clarify for people who might be joining the webinar who are like, what is continuous mechanical ventilation? What are you talking about? We're really talking about fans, fans that move air. When we're talking about mechanical ventilation, it is not just simply opening a window so you have more fresh air, it's actually turning on the fan so that you're ensuring that a certain amount of air is coming in or being exhausted from a unit at a particular time. So that's mechanical ventilation, just the use of a fan, like your kitchen range hood fan or your bath fan. When we say continuous mechanical ventilation, that just means that you actually don't have to turn that fan on because it's always running like in the background. It may be so quiet that you don't ever notice it, or it may be very loud and always a bother to you because it is always on, but that's continuous mechanical ventilation. And so, yeah, I would plus one to what, what you shared, Miranda. And for me, what I would add about the most exciting thing about the study is, is really that it was field verified. This wasn't done in a lab. This wasn't just a simulation. It was actually field verified um, in looking at how these continuously running fans are affecting the contaminant levels of indoor air in homes. And so we had direct engagement with folks living in homes and have the opportunity to help optimize their indoor air quality as it related to the use of these fans. So I'm glad simply for, for that fact of, of being able to impact the lives of the folks who are participating in the study. And then secondly, you know, we've long understood that ventilation provides benefit, but now we do have statistically significantly field verified results from multifamily affordable housing that four of the five of these contaminants of indoor air quality were significantly improved. And we have ideas about why the fifth one did not. So glad to have this data to point to, and I'm glad that we were able to actually work directly with folks in the field to make this happen and to optimize their homes. Thanks, Krista. And James? Oh yeah, I, I was really excited to see this, this study come out. Um, you know, I've been working in the, with ventilation uh, programs for you know, many years now. And again, as others have said, you know, there's always been the question of, you know, is it doing anything? You know, in my experience, after getting the funding, making it through zoning, the next most difficult thing is complying with ASHRAE 62.2. Um, <laughs> It really is a it really is a challenge. Um, at least in it's much it's less of a challenge in, in new buildings, but it's it's a huge challenge in, in, in existing buildings. And so having this uh, this you know the data to support that you know what we're doing is is worthwhile. You know we're all very concerned about the long term impacts of uh, you know the, the environment that we're building for people. You know so yeah I, I'm very I'm very happy that this this data point exists now. Um, because it really isn't, or really wasn't, um, a study that captured it before. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I think that that um, point also highlights like the challenges and opportunities of a study like this. Because I know one thing that we really talked about when we were preparing for this call is all of the like next steps that we need um, that to come out of this, and how because when you're trying to do research, not just 
purely for research sake, but you're trying to also figure out ways in which to incorporate that research so that you can push the envelope and create like right better, cleaner, safer, greener housing for folks that you end up having a lot of like what ifs come up and then you actually do need to do a bit more research which can be applied and can be done to improve upon the things that you learned previously, which I know there are a lot of lessons learned um, during the journey of this research project. And so James, I'm actually going to start with you and thinking about the next question because I think it touches a little bit upon what you've talked about. So building off of some of the study recommendations that Jonathan outlined, what will it take to see continuing mechanical ventilation included in more affordable housing rehabs and thinking about this in some of the more practical ways in which you may be implementing it while also acknowledging many of the challenges that you just brought up. Yeah and I also see in the, in the chat coming in questions related to what is continuous and uh, you know, Krista answered it but I'm going to go into a, maybe a more detailed version of it. So because it's very replicable from um, from building to building. What you're really trying to do is take out a certain amount of air from the bathroom and kitchen area and replace it with the same amount of air in the bedroom or living space. And it just constantly moves. And so in, in our world, we, we say we usually use CFM or uh, cubic feet per minute of air moved. Um, so just kind of as a, a baseline standard, you know, we're trying to take out about 50 CFM um, you know, cubic feet per minute of air out of the bathroom at any given point. And we're also resupplying into the bedroom and living space that same 50 cubic you know, CFM. And it's just on all the time, right? So you're changing the amount of air in the unit almost not quite once, once every hour, um, about half, half, a, half a change every hour. So, you know, the entire volume of the air in that unit is exhausted, right, out, out the building you know, every two hours. Um, so that's a very simple way of, of, of talking about it. Um, and, you know, now, now you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of air that's going out of the building and that's all heated air or cooled air, right? It's a lot of waste, right? So we, what we use is known as an energy, the simple way of putting it is an energy recovery ventilator um, that captures about 70% of that heat or cool air um, or the energy stored in it. Um, and without crossing and cross contaminating on its way out, um, there's there's uh, products that do this for you. Um, you know, it captures that heat and puts it into um, you know the, the incoming air. So you know the challenge is then, well, do I buy one of these things for every single unit? Do I buy one of these things for every single floor and then have a large ducting system to get it to and from each unit, or do I buy one for the whole building? right, and have even more ducting to get it to and from every unit. And each of those solutions comes with a different design challenge with how you create the ducts and don't lose the static pressure and, and things like that, um, where, you know, uh, you can get big building systems that are uh, maybe a little bit cheaper up front but harder to maintain, or you can do individual ones which are a little more expensive up front but easier to maintain, or if one goes down, you're not taking off the whole building. But, you know, you really got to think about it as, I have all of this duct work, where does it go? How do I get it from an outside air source to the unit and, and back again, but not using the same ducts? And if you're in an existing building where you didn't really maybe have the head height to put all those ducts in there, usually they go in the hallway. Where, where, where do they go? You're either going vertically through fire rated you know, floor assemblies or you're going out the outside wall. Um, and if you're in a historic building, you can't go out the outside wall, right? It's not allowed by um, the National Park Service. So th these are the challenges that we, we run into. Um, and then if the holes coming into the units are bigger than a certain size, then you have to put in fire dampers and smoke detector or smoke dampers and tie it into a fire alarm system. So that there's a real, that there's a threshold that you want to keep the ducts going into the units at a, a certain certain size. So you can see why this is you know, one of the bigger challenges of, of what we do in the, in the industry. Yeah, thank you. I think that is very helpful at outlining like the very technical aspects and kind of like, I feel like if I were an architect, you would have given me like the cliff notes of the how-to guide for different types of properties. <laughs> um, and so I was just wondering if Miranda or Krista had anything to add. Um, in thinking about, you know, the recommendations that Jonathan outlined um, 
And there was a question too that someone asked in relationship to the literature about um, indoor air quality and ventilation and, and how it relates to communities of color. And so I was hoping that maybe uh, Miranda or Krista could incorporate that into your answer because it feels like it overlaps kind of with the recommendations of this study, but also um, overlaps with some of the intentions that I think um, were made going into this study when it was when it had a slightly different name than the stove study. <laughs> So if either one of you wanted to answer that, that would be great. I can kick us off. Yeah, great, great question. So yes, to your to your larger, bigger picture question there, Uganaya, when we are looking at communities of color, when we are looking at folks with lower incomes, we are typically looking at housing environments which have more exposure to environmental toxins and less ability to do anything about it, <laughs> less ability to improve it. Um, and so one of the thoughts of looking at this study is now that we know <laughs> through the study that installing these particular types of mechanical ventilation systems can improve the contaminants in the air in living spaces, and we have the evidence base that shows that those reductions of contaminants in the indoor space lead to reduction in deaths <laughs> and health-related inequities in homes. I think we're seeing the real value of being able to apply these types of systems, particularly for communities of color and, and for communities with lower income, so that we're able to take some direct action to reverse some of these health inequities that exist. It's not the only thing that needs to be done, but it's it's now one verified arrow in our in our toolkit <laughs> um, that that we can implement to, to make a real difference. So you know what Jonathan was talking about about different recommendations that were spurring from the study about what James was lifting up about different challenges and context in, in which those must be implemented. I think we do recognize that installing ventilation in rehabs is inherently difficult because those buildings that are being rehabbed, when they were originally built, if they did not include ventilation systems, the space constraints are just um, are really challenging to work around to add a new mechanical system. So I, I do think that for folks who are funding the development or particularly the rehab of affordable housing to provide specific call outs for funding and to pair it with technical assistance to determine appropriate mechanical designs to install ventilation systems and to pay for them would be a real game changer in um, helping to reverse some of these health inequities, particularly in affordable housing through this particular strategy. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then also more, I guess, specifically Miranda, one of the recommendations directly related to resident education. So I just was wondering if you could talk about a little more about the significance of this role and the role of education in achieving overall air quality and health impacts that we all hope to see. So I'll leave it there. I have a follow up, but I want to keep that question short and I'll have my follow up at the end because maybe you all will have something to respond Great. to. That. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and I, I would just like to reiterate what the other panelists said. I, I think one of the, the key takeaways from this study is really that the study does support that you know, ASHRAE and this continuous mechanical ventilation um, should be implemented by more renovation projects. So really speaking to the, the equity and the access issue that I think was, was being raised by the intent of that question. And so, you know, kind of building on this, I, I would say that education is welcomed and wanted by the occupants that live in these homes. Specifically, I, I can speak to some of the, the study participants and interactions that I had with them. Um, they often expressed how grateful they were for the stove study, and they said that the simple fact that building managers were willing to partner with us as researchers showed that the administration really valued their health and the health of their family. Um, and so individually and as a whole collectively, participants were engaged and curious at every step of the study. Um, they were often asking questions about the sampling process and how to interpret the results. And so I, I think one of the things that was challenging to explain in my position is that although there are limits for outdoor pollutants, largely these 
limits don't exist for indoor pollutants. And so for them, when they, they would get their results and want to have something to compare it to, trying to understand that these are, are reference values. And in general, you know, there is that understanding that high levels of air pollution is, is not a good thing and that they have been linked to negative health outcomes. And so there really is an importance of using the strategies to lower exposures overall. And in, in talking with the participants, they were reported that they were unaware of what their ventilation was within their homes. So they knew in general if they had some type of stove hood fan, um, but they couldn't really describe if it recirculated or just put air back into their home or if it actually exhausted to the outdoors. And the participants that I personally interacted with really didn't have any knowledge of what the ventilation system was in their bathroom. Um, an anecdote is I remember several of them told me that there was a light switch in their bathroom that didn't work or didn't do anything. And as Krista um, mentioned earlier, a lot of times exhaust fans are often designed to be almost so silent you, you can't hear them. So you, unless you know it's there, it's easy to overlook. And so while they are continuously exhausting that air from the bathroom or from the kitchen, depending on the situation, um, as Jonathan described earlier, they often have a, what they call a boost mode. So that switch that doesn't do anything in the bathroom actually turns it to a, a higher ventilation so that if someone's taking a bath or a shower or if they're cooking over the stove, it, it can actually pull out more air to increase the ventilation. And so builders and developers who make the investment in increasing the ventilation in the home should make sure that residents are fully aware of the benefits. So the ones that we've been highlighting throughout this call today it is really seeing this decrease in um, air pollutants within the homes themselves and how residents can maximize that effect through using their ventilation properly. And most of the developers I interacted with stated that when residents do move into a new home, there's some type of orientation that they provide. So this is the perfect time to explain the importance of the ventilation in their home, how it could impact their health, and how to maximize the benefits, and how to monitor the maintenance or the function. Um, as we've mentioned, we do realize that when homes are designed, a lot of times a few years out, they might not meet the same design specifications that were intended. And actually, we were able to identify some ventilation components that were not operating as intended. And we worked with both the resident and the building maintenance to restore the function. So I, I guess my, my one key takeaway is overall, education for residents is extremely important as they're not passive bystanders, but the, they really are active collaborators in this endeavor. Thanks for that. And some of what you also said, which also I think picks up on what each of us are talking about, is that this really is a collaborative exercise. Whether you're doing the research, whether you're talking about the maintenance, whether you're talking about the building, the importance of having a real kind of like collaboration of voices from people who are going to be living in the housing to people who are maintaining um, and doing like the day to day maintenance to the folks who are designing and thinking about this to the advocates without all of those voices kind of coming together you can come you can seems like you can have either solutions or sometimes recommendations that don't necessarily reflect the total impact and can sometimes um, create i guess more challenges than were anticipated and i think that's something that i really appreciated about being a program officer who Fortunately or unfortunately gets to be the person who asks sometimes random questions and gets to, um, I guess, like suffer in adjacently to the folks who are trying to implement this is that, you know, really understanding how challenging and interesting some of this type of work can be and the real importance for, I guess, in some ways, philanthropy to partner with government entities and other folks to be able to fund this type of work over the long term is like really deeply important. I wanted to transition us into kind of taking in some questions that folks have been asking because there's a, quite a few questions that are kind of like all they, there weren't clear trends. <laughs> um, so before I kind of jump into the popcorn um, style, I just wanted to make sure that James or Krista or Miranda, if you all got a chance to really like cover everything that you thought you wanted to cover or if I needed to give you a little more time to do that before I go into some of the questions that folks have been asking in the internet world. <laughs> I think I'd like to also point out that there are real challenges around the maintenance of these systems and 
in how buildings are are staffed and the realities of, of staffing, you know, um, maintenance technicians and property managers that there's high turnover mm -hmm. in these properties. It, it, then being a property manager in an affordable housing or any, <laughs> any apartment building is a very, very challenging job. And the, the turnover rate's pretty, pretty high. And so there's this constant training that needs to happen within an organization for both of those positions in order for these systems to be maintained because they're mostly covered up and you don't see them and they're not common to every building. So it's not like something, you know, I'm going from one building to the next, they're not going to be in every single one of them. Um, the way they're designed, they tend to be fairly unique to each building, despite the fact that what you're trying to do is fairly similar. And yeah, and so we, it's hard to expend the amount of resources to keep up that level of education for your staff to make sure that they do operate properly. Um, and then on the, on the resident side, when you have continuous ventilation, it, it's often, air coming out of a duct that is not warm right and it's always coming out and they don't know what it is <laughs> if they haven't been educated properly which happens a lot and they then often will duct tape you know a piece of cardboard over it right because they don't want that cold air blowing on them and they don't know why it's happening so that's just something I've noticed, you know, going into a lot of units and talking to, to people over time and, you know, talking to the staff at, at Heartland. So, yeah, I, I would highlight that point that, it, you know, designing is very difficult, but <laughs> implementing and making sure it, it, it's doing what you are hoping it's intended to do is also very difficult. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to jump into the questions. It's going to be all over the place. I'm just letting you know. Um, one of the first questions that someone had is, are there any indications as to where the formaldehyde um, that was picked up in the readings came from? And if no one knows, then. So I can speak a little bit to that. Um, it was kind of answered a little bit in the chat, but formaldehyde is commonly found in a lot of um, occupant use materials. So it could be through um, cleaning chemicals, it could be through some of the building materials themselves. I know that um, as part of the green community criteria that there is a standard that they should be um, low emitting pollutants or to reduce the off gassing, but it, it does still happen in some of those as well. And if a resident or an occupant is bringing in furniture pieces that don't necessarily meet those same criteria, those same standards, so it might not be that the, the traditional cabinets are flooring in this scenario, but it could be um, a furniture as such as a, a couch or upholstery or some type of other chemical that they brought in for any, any other used products. Okay, thanks. Are there any strategies for ensuring that as their like national push for cooktop conversion, is happening that there is occupant education, I guess, going along with it. And I don't know, you all know. I can take a stab at, at that. I mean, yeah, I think we are seeing um, a growing wave of, in some cases, policies and regulations to switch to or to install electric or electric induction stoves rather than gas and completely agree that that need for education doesn't just go away now that you've switched out the type of equipment, you just simply need a different type of education. And I am, am not aware of a complementary education push that's parallel to that policy push. And so I think it is inherent upon all of us right now to ensure that that can happen. Um, and happy to have more of a follow-up conversation about that after the session. Okay. I, I was going to say, I would just um, add to that a little bit. I know areas it's been a local movement, um, as Krista had mentioned. There are policies now that are going into place, specifically in, in some cities in California, in which new homes are being completely electrified, so kind of reducing that gas appliance emission. But counter to that, I do know there's areas in the U.S. in which uh, natural gas industry is pushing back, and so they've actually in I believe at some places in Texas have banned such regulations. So um, again, I think there is a, a big education and policy piece here that needs to be balanced as we look at why 
these um, recommendations are being made is because they're they are significant contributors to indoor air pollutants. But I completely agree that there there is a big policy push in this field for the electrification and the um, reduction of gas appliances in homes. Okay, thanks. And I may have missed this, but I don't think I did. That does the introduction of these types of systems in the rehab process impact tenant utility costs? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, one. It's not a, a true study because I've never published it, but you know, Harlan Housing had 1,200 units um, across its portfolio in Chicago and Wisconsin. You could notice a trend even in um, new construction units between the two jurisdictions where Chicago had a higher required ventilation rate. And the utilities were certainly higher in, in our Chicago buildings um, than, than they were in our non-Chicago buildings. So ventilation is certainly playing a, a, a role um, in those higher utility costs. Now, one has to understand that in the low income housing tax credit program, those utility costs are not being passed on to the residents directly. Um, they, their rent is lower to compensate for those higher utility costs. However, the, indirectly, the developer has to come up with more capital and therefore you build less units in response to that extra added cost, if that makes any sense, right? You take a, a recurring debt and, and turn it in, you know, turn it into a capital expense. Okay, thanks. Um, there, I just want to make a note for folks that are in the audience. It feels odd because we can't see you, <laughs> um, but I, we know that we're not going to get to all of the questions, um, and we know that some of the questions are more technical in nature. And so our hope is that you can either follow up with folks um, by replying, I guess, by sending an email to the team and we'll be able to address them. Or hopefully there'll be some other way for us to answer these. So, cause there are quite a few here. I know we're not gonna get to all of them, um, but I just wanted to I mention that for everyone that continues to bring in questions. And so then does this, also apply, because I know this came up in, in the study, and I know it's come up in another study that um, JPB has funded, but can you all talk about um, how this type of work also applies to single family homes in addition to um, multifamily buildings? I can start and say that I think the most difficult application of continuous mechanical ventilation is existing multifamily buildings <laughs> because of the reasons that we, we've already talked about. And the simplest, installation scenario would be for new construction single family <laughs> because you have so many more out, outside walls to go through with your duct terminations you just have so many more options about where to put the equipment the impacts we would suppose would would be just as beneficial so while yes the study was looking at the most difficult use case we would still equally promote the installation of continuous mechanical ventilation, even in single family. Okay, thanks. And then the last, I guess, question that we'll have that I'll ask you all um, before we hand it over to Lindsay to do the closing is just, are there any like materials or pieces of information or guides that any of you would kind of point folks to if they had more questions about this? I mean, obviously, in addition to the study, which they're going to get the link um, at the end of this. Um, but if there are any materials or resources that you feel like really provide helpful information in relationship to mechanical ventilation, kind of like clean indoor air quality, they, and all the things that were kind of like covered. I don't know if you have any like go-to resources, but I'm sure that people want to know how they can tap into the brilliance that you all have. I'll throw two out there, and I'm sure Miranda and James will have more. Um, one is on the more construction side of things, and we can include a link to this in the follow-up email, but in California, in regards to compliance with their building code, Title 24, there have been some great resources put together around what are the steps to design a mechanical ventilation system that has these types of impacts. So that's one thing I would recommend that people use. And then the other resource I would recommend is actually a mantra that we came up with at near the conclusion of the study, which is turn on, turn up, open up. <laughs> so for folks who have or don't have mechanical ventilation where you live, turn on your fan if you've got a switch for it. Um, turn up your fan if you've got a switch for that or open up your windows if you don't have a fan at all. So you can still 
experience the benefit of some ventilation. So turn on, turn up, open up, something I would want to leave you with. <laughs> Thanks. Miranda or James? I would just reiterate what Krista said. I think it it really speaks to the the heart of what we what we boil down our entire report to of what we want people to take away with how they can impact their um, ventilation and how they can kind of take ownership and really make meaningful change as far as this education piece. And it really is to to use the ventilation systems um, and to to advocate for policy workers and for funding sources to to make sure that you know regardless of um, where you are in life that you have the ability to to really control your your indoor air quality exposures. So those are I, I would just reiterate our mantra: turn on, turn up, and open up. Okay. And James, the almost last word. <laughs> I like a lot of what um, you know, people in the passive house industry are doing around ventilation. And, you know, so if you want to get into some of the more weedy, how do you solve this particular challenge type things, you know, going on the, 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 the passive house website, that they have some resources in this, uh, in this category. And also the, uh, uh, the Building Science Institute uh, publishes a bunch of research papers on how to put this stuff together. Um, and this would be helpful. Okay, so thanks to all of you for sharing with us and for all the work that you've done in this area. Lindsay, I'm going to pass it on to you. I think you're going to appear somewhere. And we appreciate all of you for joining us. Thank you all so much. Um, that was a really engaging and informative session. And thank you all for joining us today. And I think we could have spent a couple more hours digging into all of the great questions that came in. We're really pleased to have this conversation. We view this session not as marking an end to the research, but really as the beginning of moving deeper into solutions that can bring the benefits of continuous mechanical ventilation into more homes. So we're really excited to uh, be at this point of translating research into action. The PowerPoint deck will be shared as well as the webinar recording and the link to the study's final report. Uh, we'll also try to make sure that we can answer some of the additional questions that came in that we didn't have time to address. And so you um, as registered attendees will be getting an email from Enterprise Green Communities with all of those resources. If you have additional questions for any of the panelists, please just reply to that email and we'll make sure that it gets to the right person. Um, that's probably the easiest way for you to get a hold of anyone um, here if you're not already uh, connected to anyone on the team. And so we look forward to continuing to engage on this moving forward. And thank you so much again for joining uh, for all of our panelists for your great uh, perspective that you brought here today. So with that, we're going to close out and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.